it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Jim. Um, uh, Dr. Jim is the uh, chair of vascular endovascular surgery at MHI. He joined us at uh, relatively difficult circumstances at the beginning of the year, um, and we uh, we are happy to have him here. Um, he uh, and his family moved uh, from uh, China to California in his early years. He went to med school at University of California in Irvine. After that, did his residency at uh, UCLA and moved to St. Louis for his fellowship at WashU, where he stayed on his staff for uh, a total of 10 years uh, there. Uh, he became an associate uh, a professor over there and then uh, became the program director of the residency and fellowship. I was, uh, I'm one of his uh, proudest achievements uh, <laughs> coming, out of, <laughs> coming out of the program. Love um, to start the conference with my <laughs> Uh, Dr. Jim has been uh, very involved in uh, multiple aspects of vascular surgery uh, from the education uh, part. Uh, he's been part of the uh, Program Director uh, Society for Vascular Surgery. Uh, more importantly, he's been very active uh, in the, uh, uh, the technical and, uh, and uh, clinical uh, applications of transcarotid artery stenting. He's trained hundreds of uh, surgeons nationally and internationally on the technique. Um, uh, he's been part of the initial trials for that uh, and uh, brings this expertise over here. Uh, he holds multiple positions in several national and regional vascular sur surgical societies, um, and uh, we're very happy to have him here. Uh, he's going to be presenting uh, a talk about uh, carotid artery disease. Uh, so, Dr. Jim. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. I'm going to move this away in fear of having some people. I'm going to take my mask off. I was asked to do that, so uh, most of you guys are pretty far away, so um, this is why I look like sorry for those of you who haven't actually seen me. So um, I'm going to go and change it over, and hopefully I do this correctly. So um, I want to thank the uh, MHIF, obviously, for the opportunity to give the talk. Um, they asked me to give a talk uh, a little bit ago, and I was like, well, i got to figure out something to talk about, probably to an empty room, so I'm really actually happy there's people here. Um, and I thought, well, let's make it easy for myself. Uh, you know, carotid disease or aneurysm disease, there's probably more interesting things that are not quite down a rabbit hole of a vascular surgeon and carotid disease. So I thought maybe I'll just kind of share what I think everybody needs to know uh, for this disease process in the next year. So moving on here, let's hope this works. So here's some disclosures. I am a consultant for Socro Medical who does a TCAR procedure. So I think it's important to mention that. Uh, I was involved in the clinical trials, the first one and the second one. Uh, but I'm really involved with them in terms of the physician education and training and basically getting every physician who needs to perform this procedure in the country and internationally certified. I also work for a couple other companies working with them for uh, aortic uh, and aneurysm intervention. So I think it's important to talk about that. As your typical CME stuff, I got to make sure to let you know I'm not talking about anything that's off label. Uh, and the opinions are my own. They don't really represent the societal committee and uh, you know participations that I have, these are just my random thoughts that I'm sharing with you. And hopefully I'll keep you guys engaged for the next 40 minutes or so. So here's some of the learning objectives. Uh, I thought it'd be important to kind of review. I know everybody here is obviously a cardiovascular specialist. Uh, talk a little bit about the epidemiology and pathophysiology of this disease process. I think it's important to share with you guys from a surgeon's perspective, what are the advantages and the risks of the different procedures that we do for these patients, be it anorectomy or stenting, specifically focusing on what we now call transfemoral cast, not just cast, not just stenting versus TCAR, and really talk about the rationale why somebody, when they see me, I may potentially recommend an intervention for them, and particularly focusing on asymptomatic carotid stenosis, because I think that's the one that's still up for the most debate. So I think I always start off with some of these numbers uh, just to kind of set the uh, stage. Uh, epidemiology of stroke is not the same as heart disease, which is what we focus on on an everyday basis, which is the number one killer. We're working on number five. So I've been giving this kind of talk for about almost a decade now. And at some point, it used to be number four. Uh, now it's moved down to number, uh, number five. As you can see, heart disease, cancer, unintentional injuries, surprisingly still pretty high up there, uh, and respiratory diseases. If you look at the numbers, I think it's something to focus back on later. Over the past decade or so, there's been a significant decrease if you're looking at just the age of judge's stroke rate. Uh, overall, the numbers are higher just because there's more people, uh, but the numbers have actually gone down. They're still pretty significant, 150,000 or so, and it accounts for about 1 in uh, 19 deaths. Uh, it's probably the most important part because it's the leading cause of serious long-term disability. 
obviously a lot of healthcare dollars to take care of these patients. But you know, when people have a stroke, unfortunately, they are sometimes young, they can't go to work anymore, they need long term care, medication. So it's a pretty significant burden on the healthcare system. Um, this number of 795,000 has been the same number for about eight years. I'm not quite sure why they don't update this, uh, and I don't really know how to look up for better ones, but it's pretty significant. Um, majority of these are obviously first attacks. Um, some people will get recurrent disease, and here are some of the estimates. Every 40 seconds, you get a, somebody that's having a stroke, and every about three and a half minutes, somebody's dying from these. And these are numbers that are updated pretty much on a yearly basis uh, to kind of see what's going on. Here's the prevalence of stroke by age and sex. If you look at it, obviously this is a disease process that affects the more elderly patients. Uh, there's a little distribution that's different between the uh, genders as well, but obviously this is something that we see in older patients. Here's the, on the left side here, it's a little bit harder for you guys to see in the back, probably a lot easier on Zoom. Uh, on the left side is the probability of death within one year. So it depends on your demographics of your uh, nationality and your gender, uh, you're talking about anywhere between one quarter to one a third of the patients will actually ultimately probably die from this. Uh, the sad thing is, you know, uh, some people will say, hey, I'd rather die than not have to deal with a stroke, but you know, those three quarters on half it will have to deal with the sequelae from it, which is a significant burden. On the right side is, you know, it's a little bit scaled differently, so I try to change it. This is out of 80% at the top, this is only 40. You can see at five years, uh, pretty high significant mortality rate, you know, coincides with pretty significant cancers as well. Uh, you know, over half the people or two thirds of the people would die from having a stroke. So obviously it's a pretty significant disease process. It doesn't necessarily mean they die from a stroke as well. Obviously they have a lot of cardiovascular disease burden. It could be something like a heart attack or, or some other event as well. Uh, the pathophysiology, I think it's really important. I think people understand this. Most of the strokes that we're dealing with in the country are ischemic. There are some hemorrhagic components to it. Obviously, it's not related to this. And it really depends on the studies you look at. It's unclear. Uh, if you look at ischemic stroke, obviously, you know, you can get it from atrial fibrillation, embolus from the heart. You can get it intracranially, something happening in there. But if you're looking at just specifically carotid disease, it's probably anywhere between 15 to 30 percent. It depends on the estimate. So it's still, if you look at all the strokes, all the ischemic strokes, this is just a fraction of that. So it's still an important fraction because this is something that we can fix. So how do you actually get a stroke from this? I think people understand if you look at the cartoon on the right side here, uh, you can see obviously you have some disease. Obviously, hopefully, you have a normal carotid artery, but when you don't, you get disease that's blocked up like this, and you essentially get strokes one of two different ways. You can have a disease process in the neck that's flow limiting, but to the point where at some point it shuts off. So now you have no flow in that blood vessel. Sometimes your body can tolerate that. We have a lot of patients that come in the clinic and they have a occluded carotid on one side and they're asymptomatic because the other side and the collateral takes care of it. Uh, another more significant problem, as you can see in the upper picture, is a little piece of debris breaks off and we don't know why. The thrombus decides to have some hemorrhagic component to it. It gets disrupted, a little piece breaks off and it travels somewhere to the brain and it affects that one particular area of the brain. That's really what we worry about mostly is the embolic uh, complication and then subsequent sequelae from this. Um, you know, symptomatic carotid disease, obviously I think people understand these terms. I don't think I go over them too much, but TIA is a, basically a neurologic uh, event that happens, but it resolves within 24 hours and it goes back to normal. Sometimes we'll call it something as a crescendo TIA, and really that, what, what that means is you're still having a TIA, but you're having potentially maybe more pronounced symptoms or maybe more importantly, more pronounced frequency. So instead of saying, oh, every couple of weeks I couldn't grab this cup or I couldn't grab this pen, now it's happening on an everyday basis or a couple of times a day, that gives you some idea of the urgency of it. But luckily, they always go back to normal. Amaurosis eudax, that's always the classic thing we learned in medical school. That's when you have the ophthalmic artery gets involved. There's a little piece of debris that goes to the eye. And it's very clear though, it's usually the patient sitting there, I was watching TV and then I just couldn't see anything. So it's not double vision, blurry vision, which most of our patients will come in with that complaint or floaters. This is where literally the classic description is a uh, shade, like a window shade comes down and you lose vision from that. Uh, it's concerning, but maybe not concerning, not as concerning as more of a hemispheric problem, which is usually a stroke, uh, where you have a deficit of some kind lasting greater than 24 hours. If it resolves at 24 hours and two seconds, it's still considered a stroke. So a lot of that is just sort of by definition. And there's this concept of a stroke in evolution. I always want to distinguish that from a transcendo TIA. 
A stroke in evolution is essentially when you have the symptoms and it's still waxing and waning. It really hasn't completely declared itself. We really haven't figured out what the issue is, but you do have a deficit that obviously lasts greater than 24 hours. So this part is pretty straightforward. When we have somebody with a stroke, you know, in this hospital at Abbott, they get admitted to the neurology service or the medicine service, and you identify them with a the stroke. A lot of times you get imaging. Our job now is to try to figure out, all right, those symptoms that they have based on the imaging, what part of the brain are they affecting, and is it correlated with the carot you know, carotid that we may find that's stenosis. So it's not always the case when somebody has a stroke and somebody has carotid disease that they're 100% true, true, and related. So it's really imperative for us to look at the imaging, look at the symptoms that they're having, and actually try to correlate that. Because a lot of times people can have significant disease in the posterior circulation, and it's really, really hard to blame that on the carotid. Because if that's the case, you fix the carotid, you're probably not gonna make them better. So that's a really important component to it. Uh, fortunately, most patients have, uh, you know, uh, uh, these sort of nonspecific symptoms are not probably related to carotid disease. So I always like to mention that. People will have complaints of syncope, almost like drop attacks. That's never almost related to carotid disease unless they're severe bilateral. That's usually when I call my cardiology friends because it's not related to what's going on here. That's something going on with the pump, right? Either the perfusion is not very good, there's some dysrhythmias. Uh, so really rarely though, you have people with severe bilateral stenosis, no matter how high their blood pressure is, they just can't get the blood to their brain and they have global issues. And that's really what syncope is. Some other things, uh, you know, unconscious people, drop, drop, uh, seizures, they get dizzy. As we mentioned, some of these nonspecific eye symptoms. Uh, in addition, incontinence, amnesia. One of my favorites is always you have a couple that comes in a clinic. Uh, let's say the man usually has a carotid disease, and then the wife goes, uh, is, it, is it the reason, the carotid disease, the reason he doesn't remember anything I tell him? I say, no, it's usually not related to the carotid. It's just being a husband, and we don't want to listen. So uh, really, those are things that we have to separate. Just because you have carotid disease, you really, really can't call them as symptomatic. So let's spend a little time talking about asymptomatic carotid stenosis as I think that's a more interesting component of this. Overall, it actually is pretty rare. So if you look at this, this is a study from about a uh, decade ago. Uh, people don't really do a ton of these population type studies. But if you look at moderate stenosis, even the oldest age group, which is octogenarians, you're really talking about less than 78%. So it's a pretty low amount of people that actually have what we consider moderate stenosis. If you look at severe stenosis, which are the ones that we may actually think about intervening on, it's obviously even lower. If you look at this, you may not be able to see in the back, it's only about one to 3%. So it's a pretty low likelihood thing. We obviously understand that if you're gonna have this disease process, you're gonna have the underlying cardiovascular risk factors. So we're talking about hypertension, diabetes, smoking, obviously hypercholesterolemia. And what we don't really know is what is the estimated risk of stroke with these patients. We're estimating about 0.5 to 1%. And this is just looking at some of the legacy trials, which we'll go over, but it's a pretty low amount. So, you know, you're talking about the likelihood of having it is pretty low, and the likelihood of having an event is pretty low as well. The other thing that we don't really know is, do people always get what we call a warning stroke, right? So, you know, we always have to clarify for patients that TI is not really a stroke, but they call it that, right? A, a warning type symptom. What we don't know is, you know, do you always have these as precursors, or is the first stroke you get basically always a stroke? So that's always a concern. And the other component is we do treat patients based on the degree of stenosis, but we understand that when you have a carotid lesion that acts up, it doesn't always have to be the most severe lesion. It could be something that's moderate or even less. So this is kind of where we're at with asymptomatic disease. And the reason I wanted to mention that is, well, do we screen for this or not, right? So that's always a pretty common question, right? We do a lot of screening things. Do we want to screen for this or not? So. We look back on the guidelines and every time I look, and I'm always surprised that there isn't neuro guidelines, but I do check almost every few months. And really, it's always still just looking at a guidelines from 2011. This is a, as you can see, all the letters on there. It's a lot of societies got together and probably sure it's probably like five or six guys and gals. They just belong to all those societies. And they came up with recommendations in terms of screening. So this is again, a little bit older, but this is a class 2A recommendation where again, it's not very 100% strong, but they feel that the benefit probably outweighs the potential risk and it's probably the reasonable to approach this. And this is kind of, I think, our everyday practice. If you go ahead and do an exam and you hear a carotid brewery, you usually recommend the patient get a carotid duplex. And that's our practice now and this is sort of the level recommendation. It's, uh, it's covered by insurance when we do that. This is what we usually find out. 
Now, there's another level of recommendation. This is a class 2B where we think, again, uh, probably the benefit is better than the risk, but we're not as sure, so it's probably something you should consider. And this is where, again, it's a little bit harder to see in the back. You know, if you're asymptomatic from a carotid standpoint, but you have symptomatic PAD, right, they come in to see you with claudication, rest pain, coronary artery disease, somebody needing a cabbage, uh, or obviously having an aneurysm. So those are people that you may consider. Or if they don't have symptomatic cardiovascular disease, they just have significant risk factors. So if you can see on the bottom right here, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, tobacco, family history, uh, or family history of having cardiovascular diseases, as well as stroke, if you meet a couple of those criteria, but I don't think that's something that we do on a routine basis. We don't necessarily screen those patients because, again, the yield is relatively low. And the concern is you find a bunch of these people, you can't unfind the blockage. Now you may intervene on them, and do they need to be intervened upon? And that's where the potential of the risk is. Never mind the fact that the patient now has a diagnosis they carry, they may worry about it, think about it, and all those kinds of things. The other component is if patients are already having these risk factors, if they're seeing a physician being cared for for those particular risk factors, hopefully they're already on the right medical management already. How much more are you going to add by diagnosing, in addition, a carotid stenosis? So that's kind of where we're at, at least with the societal guidelines. I haven't heard any rumblings of any new stuff. I know SVS has been working on guidelines for the past two years, so I've almost given up hope as to when that's actually come out. That's my Society for Vascular Surgeons. But this is another one. So this is uh, mostly the, the U.S. Uh, Preventive Service Task Force. So this is, came out in 2014. They pretty clear basically says do not screen anybody, right? This is a population-based look at the United States. They have to be very wary of the resources that we use. So right now, our guidelines, at least from 2014, is do not screen anybody. Doesn't matter if they have a brewery. Doesn't matter if the family history. Uh, right now, though, they did have an open statement earlier this year, I think in June or September. I can't remember. It was probably in June because it was in the middle of the pandemic. I remember they were having open comments, so I was typing stuff up. But who knows what's going to happen? I think ultimately it's probably not going to be the same as like, you know, where there are changes in colon cancer screening, mammograms, all that. I have a feeling that the uh, U.S. Preventive Service is probably not going to change its recommendation, and it's still up to the societies to decide what is our best way of taking care of the patient. So that's at least I think it's important to mention screening because obviously that's a chance where, you know, patients will ask you guys in your practices what to do. So in terms of diagnosing carotid disease, I think everybody knows is duplex ultrasound sort of the way to go. It's really low cost. It costs the patient, you know, obviously nothing in the sense that they get some jelly on them. There's really no risk. They get the clothes a little dirty, and that's pretty much it. It's non-invasive. Obviously, there's a financial cost to it. It's still the cheapest of all of them. What we're looking for in ultrasound is really important to focus is not looking at what it looks like under ultrasound, meaning the actual shape of the blood vessel. I can see the plaque and do the measurements. That's not how we do this. We really do it based on velocities. And if you look at some of the numbers I wrote down there, uh, this is kind of what we use in our laboratory here and pretty much across the standard across all the, the country as well. Uh, what we're looking for is usually the peak systolic, which is one of the numbers that we look at. And if you get greater than 230 centimeters per second, you already fit into the category of 70%. That's really important for people to remember. It sounds really, really bad, greater than 70, and that number you guys will put in the back of your head. But it doesn't take a lot to get there. But as we'll sort of preview now, and I'll tell you guys later, it takes a lot more than 70% for me to do anything. So some number like 230 doesn't make a significant you know, ring in my head. 300 barely makes a difference when you start getting to about 400. So just because the report says a certain thing, it doesn't necessarily mean it's time to freak out. Uh, you know, we can sort of explain to the patient what it means, uh, but usually it's, it's something that uh, we'll have to kind of focus on that particular number, not just what the conclusion says. Uh, it's very technician dependent. Uh, our lab here obviously kind of checks on the quality of the, the product that we put out, uh, but it's really important that most vascular interventionists will not intervene on a study purely on an ultrasound study if they don't know where it came from. You know, if somebody gets a study somewhere else, if I'm not familiar with the standards of the lab, I'm not going to necessarily just recommend doing it. So there will be times where we recommend repeating an ultrasound just because I want to make sure it's at a lab that I can trust. Because an ultrasound tech can potentially miss something uh, and get you a false number, and now you're making an intervention. So it's really important in that uh, in terms of the technician dependency. Um, you do get some limited anatomic information. You're really just looking mm -hmm. here. You can derive some additional uh, data as well based on inferring what the velocities look like. But really, we just look for it as a screening diagnostic tool and ultimately following a patient. We can usually utilize this 
uh, this study follow in terms of not even just, hey, they're greater than 70, but again, looking at the velocities over time, kind of see them on a regular basis. And if we need additional uh, you know, decision making, we do cross-sectional imaging with CTA and MR. So we obviously have a very big, important group here that does that and interprets those for us. But higher cost, obviously money-wise, but more importantly, contrast utilization. You got to give about 100 cc's of uh, contrast, so there's concerns for renal insufficiency. Uh, but it gives you a lot of information. You know, when we get these studies, we basically go from the arch all the way to the circle of Willis. We can look at, is there any significant inflow disease? What does the arch look like? How diseased this area is? You know, is there any intracranial disease? Is the circle of Willis competent? Is it full? Uh, but, you know, there are some concerns, too. A lot of artifact, especially dealing with carotid stenosis, people with calcium, uh, people that get surgeries in the past and have clips in there. Sometimes you get these voids when you get the MR. So there's plus and minuses. And the last one is uh, basically contrast angiography. We don't do this very often, but that is considered the gold standard. If all your other tests are not very clear and you don't really know what's going on as a physician, we recommend getting a contrast study. Now, the problem with it is obviously invasive procedure. We have a lot of proceduralists in the room, so I'm not really as concerned about getting a hematoma in the groin, which is pseudoaneurysm. That's obviously an access site thing, but there's always a risk of procedural risk of stroke too. The old studies, and we're still supposed to quote people 1%, overall, when you look at most stroke centers, it's probably way less than that, but they're also adding a lot of people with you know, weird disease processes like aneurysms in the brain or bleeds where they have normal aortic arches. So when you get down to looking at carotid stenosis in a carotid disease patient with an angiogram, you do have to think about potentially getting a stroke rate of almost 1%, which is pretty significant when we're talking about asymptomatic patients getting strokes less than 1% per year just from the disease process. How to treat this? Uh, so obviously, I think this is everybody in this room knows in terms of treating uh, carotid disease, I'm gonna start off by just basically saying, by default, going forward, everything I talk about is gonna include medical management. I think mm -hmm. everybody understands that. Best practice for all patients, so what that means, medical therapy with antiplatelet agents, you have to be on high doses of stents if they can tolerate it, obviously the highest dose that possible. Manage everything else, right? We asked our PCPs, cardiology colleagues, hey, please make sure the hypertension's well controlled uh, towards the guidelines, obviously get the A1C down. Uh, lifestyle modification, uh, every time I look at those pictures, I feel sad. Every time I go travel out of the country, and I always go to the duty-free shops, and I'm always sort of fascinated by the cigarette boxes they sell. They all have these giant boxes that smoke and kills uh, when, when we buy cigarettes in this country. Not that I do that. Uh, they don't really have those, but you can mm -hmm. so always see them. So every time I go on a trip, I always try to take a picture and then use it for a slide. Um, you know, I think everybody, in terms of treatments of carotid disease, everybody's pretty familiar with carotid erectomy. I can go on for days talking about this, but there's only a handful of surgeons who want to know the nitty-gritty details, so I won't. But the idea is we expose the blood vessel, right? We make a cut as small as we can, as big as we need. We expose everything here, as you can see in the upper left. Uh, then we kind of make an incision, open the blood vessel after getting control. Sometimes we put in this little shunt in here that temporarily feeds the brain and with flow when everything's clamped off. I think sometimes you get asked that, even as cardiologists seeing patients. Then there's flow while we're working around it. We get the little plaque out, and then when we're done, we kind of repair the artery. Uh, so this is kind of how we do an endorectomy. Another opportunity of doing it is the cartoon on the right side. Uh, sometimes we do what we call an eversion, where as you can see, we transect the carotid artery in the upper right over here. We kind of unroll it, almost like unrolling a sleeve. You get that little plaque out, uh, clean it out. Now that it's nice and clean, you sew it back in uh, after you've cleaned off the common carotid. So those are different ways of doing it, but the idea is you physically go ahead and remove the debris the potential source of emboli, the hemorrhagic plaque, whatever you want to call it. Obviously, complications can happen, so what are the standards? If I want to go sell myself out as a carotid surgeon, what do I have to meet in terms of threshold? It's surprisingly pretty easy. <laughs> um, the 30-day stroke death and stroke race is still on, on paper. AHA says 3% is your bar for asymptomatic disease and 6% for symptomatic disease. I think most people that do this will agree this is too high. But again, we're looking at 2011 data. Nobody's gone on and say different things. But that's really the low, you know, as low as you got to keep it. Obviously, zero is what you're going for. But I always knock on wood and tell people it's never going to be zero. You do enough of this. It's just like buying lottery tickets. You buy enough, you eventually win one. So same thing. You do enough of this, you're going to get a stroke at some point. Uh, other complications we have to think about. Bleeding is pretty unlikely, but it happens. I would say take back to the operating rooms, usually less than 1%. But if you look at the literature, it's between one to four. 
Wound infection, probably, it's pretty unlikely. It's a really well vascularized area, so we don't have to worry about that as much. Cranial nerve injury is pretty significant. We do talk about that with patients as well. As you can see in the cartoon on the, on the right side there, uh, you don't have to read all the words, but there's a whole bunch of nerves floating around when we do this operation. So you have a potential of injuring them as well. Vagus, hypoglossal, facial, those are the big cranial nerves that we usually injure. Uh, but if you look at it over time in terms of the decades, I think experience is getting better. We're much more careful than our people that taught us. So it used to be as high as 8%, but down to probably about 2% now. Uh, and luckily, only a fraction of those are actually permanent. So sometimes we'll do this operation, and we're carefully moving the hypoglossal nerve out of the way. We will know when the patient wakes up, their tongue is going to point to one direction. But even within that same first day hospital stay, no kind of deviation will go away, and luckily they usually resolve. So it's pretty rare to get it, but when it happens, it really, really sucks. Patients can have a droopy lip. Uh, they're going to look like that forever. If you have a uh, problem with the vagus or something with swallowing, that could be pretty debilitating, just as bad as a stroke. Uh, recurrent stenosis is another thing that actually can happen. We love to say that uh, I can cure my patients, but anybody who's in the cardiovascular field know uh, we don't actually cure anybody. We just temporize them, uh, that there is a risk of about 1 in 20. So in two years or so, one of every 20 people will probably need some intervention again. I always say, you know, most physicians like me will remember that rate to be a lot lower. I honestly don't remember taking care of that many of my patients coming back but probably maybe they're mad at me and they went somewhere else and that's why I don't know. Uh, but that number, if you look at clinical studies, is about one in 20 or so. Uh, but again, I think most of us remember it to be a little lower. Uh, so I think people know this already, the evidence for CA, right? Why do we do CEA? So start off with symptomatic. So I think almost everybody in here um, has, should know what the NASA trial, right? This is the early 1990s, so it's been around for a long time. Basically, they took a bunch of people. They weren't sure back in the day, you have symptomatic carotid disease. Half the time, I will fix you, half the people, the other half we watch. And this was one of those trials that, you know, as all of us know, anytime a trial gets stopped early because there's a significant difference, it's pretty significant. So this is where, when you were dealing with patients that had a 70 to 99% stenosis, as you can see here, um, it was a significant difference in terms of the stroke rate. If you look at the picture on the right side, that you have about a 9% stroke rate in two years for people getting anorectomy, while 26% if you're just medical management alone. So that was such a significant, prominent thing. They felt it was unethical to continue, so they stopped the trial, and that's where we've always set the bar. 70% symptomatic patients we can go ahead and treat. That was done in the early 90s. Well, they had a whole bunch of other people that they were following as well, so they kept following them out. So we actually have some data as well for 50% or greater. If you can see in the bottom there, it got published a few years later, but there is a significant difference also, but it's not as big. Instead of 9 and 26, it was 15 and 22. It was over five years, there was a difference, but that difference was a little bit less. But if, when you put the totality of the trial, we have data that support treating people with 50% stenosis uh, as long as they're symptomatic from the carotid disease. So this has been around since the early 90s. Uh, we really haven't changed that. Nothing's really changed. This is still what we're going with. Everybody in the medical field believes this and knows this. We're not going to do any more trials. So this is kind of set in stone. Where it gets interesting is asymptomatic. So around the same time they were studying this, so you know they were just, again, the, the design of the people, they just had two groups that didn't design together, so they stratified at 60%. So the numbers are a little weird, but they have data that basically show, this is the ACAST trial on the left side, 90s again, that basically shows that if you treat patients of 60% stenosis in five years, there is a difference. So again, NASA was two years with a 26 to 9% difference, huge difference. ACAS was five years, 11, and six. So it's significant enough that made us all start treating asymptomatic. I wasn't around then, but people were treating them. But if you look back on it, it's not actually that significant. They were decreasing your risk of stroke by half, which sounds really, really you know, significant. But you were talking about a yearly stroke risk of 2% with medical management down to one for CEA. But that's kind of what the data was. The ACST trial came out about a decade later. It kind of confirmed that as well between 12 and 6%. So this is kind of where we've been at. It's been about 60%, at least in the clinical trial, and that sort of pervades in the literature and sort of our behavior. But we know that some people can't get CEAs. So, well, who are these people? Well, who are the people that we treat that may potentially have high risk of complications with CEA? If you look at the list, the left side as a surgeon, I can tell you, yep, I don't want to operate on those people, right? Neck, neck you know, cancers, that radiated previous surgeries, 
I can probably find the carotid, I can clean it out, but I may injure a lot of nerves along the way, right? People with really high lesions, I may have a hard time getting all the way up to the top. Uh, you worry about people with contralateral cranial nerve injury because one of the things I can do is hurt a cranial nerve. If you knock out both, they're going to have a trach, so that's a problem. Uh, contralateral occlusion, bilateral stenosis, these are just people anatomically we think have a high risk. If you look at the right side, this is where we ask our cardiology friends to help us figure out, right? Older patients, we think they're going to have more problems with general anesthesia. Well, sometimes they have heart failure, heart disease, they need neocoronary revascularization, uncontrolled diabetes. So these are people that we know potentially have really significant complications if we do a CA on. So obviously, you know, we don't want to do a CA on, and just like everything else, there's endovascular techniques. So carotid angioplasty and stenting was something that was developed in the early 90s, just when we were starting endovascular or anything. Uh, this is when it really came about. As you can see in the picture, and I'll kind of go through a little bit of the progression, you can see there's a focal stenosis on the first picture on the left, and the idea is that you put this little filter across to catch any debris. As you can see over here, there is a little netting. It's almost like a little windsock. You catches any debris. You go ahead and below that, you go ahead and treat the lesion by putting a balloon in there. Ultimately, you deploy a stent. You can see maybe a little bit that scaffolding that's in place. You retrieve the device when you're done. You do a completion angiogram where everything looks perfect. So this is, a again, just very similar to coronary stenting. And now, obviously, valvular disease. You try to go remotely endovascularly. Um, the evidence for this really came out in SAFIRE trial. This is in 2004. This was the study that basically looked at only high-risk patients because we knew that high-risk patients are the concerning ones. And they were comparing stenting versus anorectomy. As you can see here, um, this is the graph that they had, the kaplan meyer and you can see there's clearly a derivation and differentiation between the two curves. The problem is if I blew this up any bigger, you see those little confidence intervals actually overlap. So really, they're not statistically significant, certainly does not show superiority, but the data shows that at least it's not as bad, it's not inferior. So because of that, uh, the FDA and the approved the devices and CMS says, all right, we will go ahead and reimburse, allow people to do carotid stenting, uh, but it's only for high-risk people, because that's what the study was. We only believe it for symptomatic disease, and it has to be 70%. So if you do all those and you want to go treat that patient with stenting, we will go ahead and pay you. As you know, all physicians, it's great to do FDA approval things, but how we behave is really based on reimbursement. So in 2005 now, we have another way of treating these patients, which is stenting. Um, there's some additional allowance with clinical trials, which we won't get into. But that's kind of where we're at. Now, subsequent to that, we get more studies because we really want to study what stenting is all about. So this is a European study, ICSS. It probably doesn't get cited enough in the US when we look at carotid stenting literature, but it's a really good study. It looked at people that they felt was suitable for both interventions. So these are not high risk. These are just all comers. What's really important about these trials, I think I need to mention, is the people that were doing the, the trials, the operators, the proceduralists, they were really, really good. They were carefully chosen. They do a lot of these procedures. They were active, doing a lot of stenting, at least 10 a year, 50 lifetime, which is not something that is standard across you know, most patients in most places. Uh, if you look at it, again, it's hard to see, but you just have to get the theme of it. If you look at the little Kaplan-Meier curves in the middle, those curves aren't even close. Uh, you can see clearly there's a significant difference between CEA and stenting. So the European trial clearly shows superiority of anorectomy, so much less enthusiastic about stenting. If you look on the right side, the forest plot there, again, you can see pretty much almost, sorry, I knew I was going to try to do that. You can see right here, this on the right side here is these are things that favor anorectomy. You can see almost everything favors anorectomy. Uh, so again, not every single point is, is it's, it's significant because it crosses the middle, but the data is pretty clear that stenting is not quite as up to par as anorectomy. So this is in Europe. So of course, we don't really care because European necks are different than the ones we take care of. So let's look at the US data, which is Crest, right? So this was a really big deal. This started out in the early 2000s. I remember I was a resident taking care of these patients and really you got to take care of them with extra bubbles and gloves because they were treated very differently. Again, very different than your everyday patient. We're looking at people that were suitable for both. And very importantly, there were lead-in phases. If you were not a good proceduralist and you had bad results, they kicked you out. So again, it's not a real world setting, but you know, we look at it and here's kind of, again, looking at the outcome. So this is where we started to add not only death and stroke, which is a lot of the old data, but we'll start talking about MI. So the first thing to talk about is the difference of stroke, which is this box right here. 
The stroke with stenting is about 4.1% compared to the anorectomy, which is 2.3%. So it's a significant difference. But to kind of make up the difference, you can see right here, actually there is a higher risk of myocardial infarction for people getting CEAs because they were getting probably more likely general anesthesia versus a percutaneous based procedure. The death rate fortunately was low for both, but the thing is when you add them all up together, the new sort of MACE endpoint with major adverse uh, events, looking at it, everything, it's about 5.2% for stenting and 42 and essentially statistically equivalent or not, you know, not statistically different. So this is sort of how you slice the data in terms of the procedural for, for, um, for uh, CREST. If you look at longer term, this is four years, including the periprocedural rate. You look at overall death is very similar. Stroke is still a little bit higher. Uh, and then ultimately, again, because of the difference with the MI early on, when you look at the primary endpoint, uh, they're pretty equivalent. So the challenge of it now is this came out and published in 2010. That's a decade ago now. That came out in February. Remember, I was very anxiously waiting for this. We're still pretty much debating what this actually means. Uh, you can say, hey, I'm doing a procedure to fix your risk of stroke but we're actually causing more strokes, but people will argue, the stenting enthusiasts will say, hey, you cause a lot more heart attacks than the other way, but I can argue back again, do you want a heart attack that you didn't know you have, or do you want a disabling stroke that affects your life? So when it's said and done, that's kind of what people have been doing for the past decade, arguing about the data and see what's going on. So when it's said and done, we don't really know what the data shows, except clearly I think people will say it's not superior, it may be equivalent or maybe inferior, we're not really sure. So, you know, some additional endpoints looking at CREST 2, really the differentiation between, you know, good and bad is about 70 years old. Uh, really, that's when everything is about equivalent. Anybody older than that should get an anorectomy. Everybody younger potentially can get a stenting. Uh, if you're looking purely at stroke, that inflection point's at 64 years old. Um, you know, maybe there's higher risk in women. We've always worried about the different outcomes in gender. Uh, but really, when it's said and done, no difference between symptomatic status. So when it's said and done, it's really important to kind of always mention the CREST study. There's a lot, a lot of information that we get from it. But the ultimate money shot at the end, I'm not sure we really figured it out because it's sort of difficult to interpret data. So some subsequent study from that, ACT-1 came out. This is just looking at another study looking at asymptomatic only, and it really shows somewhat equivalence between stenting and CEA. So when it's said and done now, you know, where are we with stenting? How do we do this? We're not really sure. Uh, so I think it's always important to look at, well, what are we actually doing in the country? So the data here is a little bit outdated because there's some lag in terms of collecting it, but it really shows our practice. You can see right here, the blue is the anorectomy. So at the beginning, there was a fair amount being done. Obviously, it took off in 1995, right? Well, why is that? So that was when the ACAST study came out. There was a the data that shows you treat 60% of stenosis, you can show benefit, guess what? Everybody started getting erectomies. So that's gone up, right? So that is, you can see a huge jump. But over time, the enthusiasm has waned, and I'll get to that later. We're kind of gone away from that. It's significantly going down. If you look at stenting, you know, it came about in 2005. We got enthusiastic about it. But even despite the trials, and I think maybe the confusion of the trials, really the coverage hasn't changed. If you don't improve the payment for things, you're not going to actually get people doing more of those. So the question though still is, you know, do we just abandon stenting? Well, is it a durable technique? And the answer is yes, it actually works really, really well. We have 10-year data now, this is Crest. If you look at the, the slides over here, there's obviously a differentiate between the two in terms of outcomes, but really all that difference comes at the very beginning. There's no difference long-term, but the real difference is at the very beginning. If you can do your procedure well at the beginning, the stent works really, really well. It's surprising because stents anywhere else on the vascular beds don't work well. Carotids, it does. Here's another study looking at it. This is, uh, includes the CREST data looking at all these four trials that do the randomized controlled trial. They put it all together. Again, you can see a huge difference on the left side between stenting and anorectomy. But if you eliminate the periprocedural time, which we can't do for a real patient, but just looking at long-term durability, if you look at the right side, equivalent basically. So again, it really tells you if you can improve the periprocedural safety of this procedure, you can get long-term outcomes that you're looking for. So I don't really want to abandon this. So we got to think back on how do you actually get strokes? Well, when you get strokes from transfemoral stenting, there's different phases for this. You know, you go ahead and catheterize. You got to get your sheath and wire all the way up from the femoral up. You're going to hit all this stuff. You're going to deal with the arch and the disease process. At some point, you get your sheath in the common carotid. I got to go and put a embolic protection device. I got to cross the lesion without the protection. You can get, you know, get embolization that way. And then we're obviously manipulating. So this is kind of why we get strokes within a transfermal procedure. 
Well, we can eliminate that. And I remember as a, as a young attending, I was like, I don't want to do it this way because this way sucks. I just started accessing all my carotid arteries at the base of the neck. I'm going to avoid all the stuff, but I still had all these other issues. And luckily, around the same time as I was thinking about this, somebody else was really smart and came up with this other procedure called TCAR. So I think most of you guys have seen or heard about this. This is just sort of a newer way of doing this, where instead of going from the groin and delivering all the devices at that point, you go at the base of the neck here, you get direct carotid access, you clamp the blood vessel, there's no way for things to go up to the brain, and what you're ultimately doing is you know, creating a situation where the flow is reversed. You have arterial pressure distally, venous pressure on the other side. You basically go ahead and have stuff coming down, so you're catching all the potential debris. And sometimes when you do these cases, all the stuff that you catch could potentially go to the brain, but now you're catching it away from it and going into a filter. So this is a neuro procedure that came about, and I'm going to try to speed up a little bit, but basically the data has been really excellent. So this is the original trial that we participated in 2012, um, four, uh, 18 sites, only 140 people. But it was pretty amazing. This was, we were really surprised. We were very careful with these patients. The stroke rate of 1.4 is literally the lowest that's ever been published. Granted, it's a clinical trial, select people, small group. Uh, so, you know, but ultimately got FDA approval. So, you know, we got to do better, right? 141 is not enough. The FDA says do another trial. So we did. So Roaster 2, I think Abbott was a, a participant in Roaster 2 as well. Uh, basically, you look at it. They said, you got to go find a bunch of other people. 80% of the people had to be new. They've never done this before. Prove it. Do it again. So about almost 700 patients that were high risk. Uh, we, they analyzed, an, uh, FDA only wanted to analyze per protocol, and the amazing results of even better, right? So we thought 1.4 was pretty crazy. Now we got to about 0.6. So we show that the, the number is really, really good. So we've gotten even better now. So right now, so we have a really good technique with really significantly low stroke rates on our hands, and that's been utilized in our practice quite a bit. So getting to the punchline, so what is our current practice now with um, carotid disease? Well, again, you go back, this is only 2014. It's been a while, so hopefully people will come up with this. So symptomatic, we won't talk about. This is really looking at asymptomatic. This is where we're at. Medical management has to be done. It's reasonable to consider CEA in asymptomatic patients greater than 70%. But, you know, we don't really know, right? Effectiveness compared to, to BMT, best medical therapy, is unclear. They're talking about transdermal cast, enthusiasm still very lukewarm. I don't know where TCAR comes into play, so that's not even addressed here. And certainly anybody at high risk for complications are not going to be considered, right? So you always have to balance those two things. So, you know, the problem is how many strokes are we actually going to prevent? Remember one of the things I said, like my, my slide number two, numbers of strokes are going down, right? So if people are not getting strokes, am I really going to prevent them? So here's some data. Ann Abbott is a lady who is really an advocate about non-interventions. So she's able to show that overall population studies, the number of strokes are going down significantly. Really, you also have to look at is what we're talking about effective. So I think people need to understand the difference between effectiveness and efficacy, right? Real world data. You're not talking about some clinical trial, which obviously everybody here is familiar with. Does this work or not? So here's a nice study. So if you guys know Burke Myers, a guy up in Michigan who did a lot of these type things. And basically, they were able to look at Medicare patients. The references of getting good outcomes are pretty amazing, less than 1% stroke during those surgeries. If you look at the bar on the right side, even at the most high volume trial hospitals, if you took a regular patient, non-study patient, the stroke rate was higher, never mind at a low volume hospital. So you're not giving those patients the exact same treatment or outcomes that you're hoping for in a clinical trial. Here's another study looking at just published data in terms of registries and stuff like that. If you look at the bar of setting the, the minimum bar of 3%, that's what we're looking for. Nine out of stenting studies, one out of 21 coronarectomy studies actually have a higher than that. So in real life, we're not even meeting what I consider a relatively easy bar to meet from AHA standards. So can you apply this to all the patients out in the world? So because of that, you know, we also want to look at the effectiveness of TCAR. I'm going to fly through some of these slides because I want to get to the end. But what's nice is we've been able to keep an eye on this technology, which I think is one of the few things that we've been able to do, at least in the vascular world, where we can keep track of a technology as it rolls out. Anybody who wants to get reimbursed right now has to enroll in this thing called VQI, which is a quality initiative. We have every single TCAR done in, this, in the country as they're rolling out. We can keep track of it. So it's nice to be able to see that. Uh, and you have a lot of enthusiasm, increasing numbers of sites since it's approved more and more cases being done. And Barb is the one that actually helps us in our, uh, in our institution here. 
But really, there's a lot of data, and I will, I'll fly through some of these. But basically, if you look at it, we're capturing about 96% of all TCAR procedures. So we're really seeing what's going on out in the world. You can see on the bottom there, a variety of different specialties doing these procedures too. It's not just a vascular surgeon centric specific uh, database, obviously a little bit biased that way because um, those are the most of the people doing it. If you look at the outcomes, um, the comparative transfemoral stenting is significantly better. We know that there's a lower risk of stroke, death, and, uh, and MI. Um, sorry, no difference in MI, difference of death and stroke uh, outcomes. What's nice is we're able to replicate the low risk of MI even though I'm putting people under potentially sometimes general anesthesia. Compared to CEA, here's another study looking at pretty high numbers, you know, 5,000 patients. We're no longer talking about the 141, the 632. Uh, we can see, again, significant favorability for CEA. Lower MI, uh, because of that, it drives the primary endpoint. Uh, the people get to go home early, which is, we, we should not care about those things, but really important out in COVID. And you've almost eliminated cranial nerve injury, which is a really significant component to that. Um, the other thing that's really nice, too, is this is, again, showing the learning curve. We're taking this technology, teaching all the people out there to do this, and we want to make sure that is safe for even the newest users. So if you look at the breakdown of this uh, data cut here, about 4,000 patients, 80% are done within the first 20 cases. So we're not talking about like Crest experience, you know, not that type of scrutiny. We we're still able to show that there was no significant difference in the stroke and mortality rates coming out. Now, as you get older or more experienced with this, um, you have much more mature experience. You're going to be much faster. You may want to do sicker patients. So there's definitely some benefits to it, but we'll be able to show a really good outcome. We're able to teach patients. Uh, but you know, the other thing too is we're also learning too. If you look at the clinical trial, remember I said the study showed as 0.6 outcomes? Well, there's always some dirty laundry that's hidden in there too, right? So if you look at what's, what we've learned is, you know, besides being the proceduralist doing something really important, we realized about 60 cases out of the 692 had a protocol violation. And when you did the math, nine more strokes in that particular group. That's a huge stroke risk, right? You say, well, how is this real world then? You excluded those patients. Well, the difference is we know most of those people just didn't take their medications. If you go ahead and follow the protocol, you actually get a really, really good outcome. So one of the things that we've learned now is not only worry about how we do the procedure, but making sure that all these other things that we never thought about, the medication compliance, is actually a big component. If you do that, you're going to get the good results. If you don't, you're going to get a horrible outcome. So who will I treat in 2021, right? So I think that's probably the last part and I'm, I'm nearing the end there. Um, symptomatic patients, I think it's pretty clear, greater than 70% you wanna go ahead and treat and maybe select greater than 50%. That's usually a discussion with the neurologist. All right, is there anything else going on? Is there AFib? Is there intracranial disease? There's data for it, but it's not as strong, but there's some debate still about that group. Asymptomatic patients, I don't treat somebody in a good surgical candidate. They gotta be functional, they have you know, comorbidities well controlled because they got to live three to five years for them to derive any benefit from what I do, right? Because they got to live long enough to potentially have the stroke for me to eliminate that risk. So if they're older, not because I'm an ageist, but they have to live three to five years. If they're not going to, I'm not going to offer that. They have to get a carotid stenosis greater than 80%. Now, I know it's hard to do that on ultrasound because most of those will say greater than 70. There's other things you can look at. The end diastolic velocity has to be high. So again, just because a PSV number is 300, that may not be sufficient. So I'm pretty hard. I think all of us are in this practice are. We're pretty, pretty strict about who we offer it to. And I want to make sure my perioperative procedure outcome is less than 1%. Right? So I keep track of all of it. I remember I've had two patients with strokes, one on each arm. Uh, I know them. I remember them well. And I'm going to wear that to them my grave. I know that. And I keep track of it. So hundreds and hundreds. I, I know what my numbers are. And I don't want to get more. But it's something that's really, really important. I tra traditionally, I'm a TCAR first guy. I think it's a great technology if you have the uh, reimbursement criteria for it, but you have to do it in the right anatomy. But otherwise, the CA works very well also. I really think I've gone away from doing transformal stenting. I've only done one in the past five years because I've had TCAR on my hands for such a long time. And that was a patient with a laryngeal stoma. And I just didn't want to change glove five times and put on different gloves and, and different machines because there's colonization. So in the last minute, um, I think anything else we need to know Crest 2, right? So when Crest 1 doesn't answer anything, Crest 2 comes out. So this is the trial that's been ongoing. I'm um, not quite sure what's going on there because the results are, are slow to come by. Uh, some difficulty with accruing, but basically this is a study looking at medical management compared to intervention. I think a couple months ago they're actually changing protocol, maybe. I don't know if that's been announced yet to try to add GCAR to it, and that's always a concern when you change a protocol seven years into it. So we're not sure where that's going to go. 
Um, imaging, I don't want to go into all this. You know, at some point, we got to be able to look at a, a lesion and say, this is the high risk lesion. This patient's high risk. We don't know. We haven't figured that out. I was working with somebody at my previous institution. They were doing a lot of inflammatory marker, PET studies, looking at the lesion. Maybe we can say, hey, your 80% is different than your 80%. Maybe we'll figure that out. What does it mean for cognition, right? We don't know that. We're looking at things like TCD, WMRI, so a lot of things to try to figure it out. Stent design, right? Can we make the devices even better? So this is an example of some of the newer stents out there. Instead of just having a metal scaffold, like the pictures on the top there, where by design there's little holes, tiny, tiny, but there's interstices, can you push another little layer of mesh so things can't come through? So a lot of enthusiasm. Trials are flying out left and right, mostly from Europe, but there's some problems with it. Higher rate of uh, instant stenosis, potential thrombosis, because you know that's a problem. We want long-term durability. We have it for the bare metal. We have 10-year data. We only have 30-day 30, 30 or one-year data for this, so we don't know if it's going to be an issue long-term. So to summarize, uh, I think stroke and carotid disease is not only a fun thing, but certainly a significant disease process. I think really the thing that I always want to mention is optimal medical management is absolutely mandatory and that's really, really important. Um, I think there's potential benefits, appropriate screening and otherwise asymptomatic patients, but certainly not. You can't do that for everybody. Uh, it has to be particular high risk. Carotid revascularization I think is an important treatment option. Uh, I think the enthusiasm over the past two decades for it has gone down, but I think certainly is still the place for it. And really depending on the patient's anatomy is how we treat them either with the TCA or CEA. And finally, uh, I think further research will hopefully help us identify which patients we can actually target for asymptomatic and really continue to refine our techniques to reduce the risk associated with carotid revascularization. So with that, I wanna say thank you. So for anybody who's actually seen me give a talk, I always do something about the city I'm at. So it used to be an arch for St. Louis. So I thought, you know, this is what I should do. I'm new to St. Uh, Minneapolis. So I th I've actually never been to the cherry thing yet, so someday I think I'll go there. Uh, and that was just a cool picture. But, you know, so, but really, I think I really need to everybody know this, you know, about me is this is important. I'm going to love Minneapolis. Uh, but really, I think the most important thing is got to talk about the LA sports. So this is a big year for me. Uh, it's been a horrible year for pandemic, uh, but it's been kind of fun for me. I joined this institution, work with a lot of new friends and Honestly, two of my favorite teams won championships, so uh, I'm pretty happy. So with that, I'm going to stop and thank everybody for your attention. I have no idea what we do now. Oh, there's a question. Yes, thanks. Great talk. Thanks for uh, reminding this for us. It was fantastic. So um, the question is, you know, you mentioned that medical therapy is very important, which I completely agree. Do you think that explains some of why over time, we started to see the stroke risk comes down, maybe because we are adopting more of the medical therapy. We just published a paper, actually, just recently on the adoption between endovascular surgery and endovascular in community to use statins in their patients. And it's been really, for the best case scenario, around 60%. Right. So I think we still even stay short with medical therapy. So what's your take about that? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's a huge component. The statins came about, you know, 90s and 2000s, right? Yeah. So when you go back and look at these old trials, the medical management was very vague. It was like, you know, they're on an aspirin and, you know, blood pressure control. And certainly those guidelines have improved and nowhere in there was mentioned statin. So I think that's a huge component of it. So, you know, I think regardless of what we're talking about in terms of interventions, you have to get the maximal therapy for everything. So I think adoption is pretty low. At some point, I always joke around, I'm surprised they don't just put it in water. You know, once in a while we'll get some muscle aches, but, you know, it's probably so good that we should, everybody should take it. Here's Sharky. Thank you for that very nice presentation and for doing such a good job of training Joe. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, I decided to come here to make sure that, you know, I don't think he's actually done, so I'm going to keep an eye on him, you know, but I just really wanted to get rid of him at that point. I was an early program director. I just couldn't have to handle it anymore. Well, um, at any rate, what are your thoughts about um, the asymptomatic 70% or greater stenosis of somebody that needs bypass grafting or a bowel replacement? Sure, good point. So the question is, you know, what do we think of people with, you know, a, an asymptomatic stenosis, high grade, and who may need a, uh, a, a some other intervention, be it a valve or, or whatnot. So I think unilateral disease, if you're looking at it, uh, we don't usually recommend doing anything for uh, just because they have it. And the reason for it is the risk of, again, we don't know this for 100%, but the risk of embolizing thrombosis from it is pretty low. 
The only time we'll probably consider it with conjunction with the other interventional list, be it the cardiac surgeon or the um, usually not worried about TAVRs, uh, that kind of stuff, is, is if it's bilateral. Uh, because they worry about overall perfusion, right? How high can they run the pump to get the blood to the brain? Uh, so that's potentially a reason where we may think about intervening. But gone are really the days where we routinely do, you know, combined, you know, cabbage, carotid. There are still situations where, you know, I think that's beneficial, but certainly asymptomatic unilateral severe stenosis, we don't intervene on that. Yes? Thanks for the talk. <clears throat> did the uh, use of filter wires ever go through a clinical trial, or were they just adopted, like, from cardiology? Uh, and does it really... Re result in a significant reduction in stroke? That's a great question. The question is, does work for, you know, filter wire, distal embolic protection, was that something that study? So they were. The earlier trials, the early, early trials didn't always have that. But when the SAFAR trial in the 2000s came out, that mandated some type of distal embolic protection. So that was something that's built in. So if you want to get reimbursed, um, you have to use it, some kind of protection mechanism. The data of it still kind of depends now retrospectively looking at, regardless of reimbursement. There are studies that look at, you know, people that would do it, and it doesn't show a significant difference. Um, so I think, though, but practice now, unless there's a reason, you really should, you're expected to. That's considered standard of care. And not every single one have gone through all of, you know, all the derivations. But, you know, it was certainly derived from coronary, but the data does support using that, at least clinical trial going forward. Yes, sir. Do carotid artery buoys correlate to significant stenosis? Not at all, right? So it's one of those. Do uh, I don't know. So it's fine. I, I, I listen because I feel bad if I don't um, because I'm a vascular surgeon. But honestly, like, you know, if I hear it, I think I hear it half the times from the heart. Um, but you're right. It doesn't correlate at all, just like, you know, the, the belly exams for the aneurysms. And it doesn't. It's one of those things that's there. Um, but it does end up finding you some carotid stenosis, and it goes back to the idea of screening, right? So now you find something that you, now you didn't know before, now you're gonna send them to a guy like me, and now we have to think about either stressing out the patient, telling them I'm not gonna operate it on, or gaff it, but I operate and cause a problem. But you're absolutely right, the correlation is probably less than 50%, which is sad because it's worse than flipping a coin. I just, to comment on that, like in the last month, I've heard two brewings on exam. The first person had critical carotid disease and the other one had no disease. So uh, it's, it's sad that it doesn't uh, correlate with it. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't correlate at all, which is sort of the, the challenging thing. You know, again, we, we listen for these things just like I listen for an abdominal brewery. Have I really heard one in my life? Probably not, but I, <laughs> I pretend I hear one. I don't know, you know, so it's just one of those things. Uh, it, it, it's... We have trainees in the room, so we got to make sure we tell them we, we, we have to listen to everything. But honestly, you know, if COVID hasn't taught us anything, is we're completely relying on imaging. You know, we talk to the patient to see what size they are, how clean the areas are to operate, but really we make decisions based on imaging. Yeah. What's your uh, antithrombotic therapy uh, management for patients going for TCAR? What's kind of antiplatelet? What's, what's sure. your... Uh, your mandatory is dual antiplatelet therapy. That's pretty well established for for you know, any type of stenting procedure. You know, for us, it's always usually been aspirin and Plavix uh, because there's the wealth of data and that's what the clinical trial shows. Uh, however, as we all know, there's a, the issue of potential Plavix resistance, which is a real thing uh, that I think, you know, I think as vascular surgeons, I always sort of we're behind compared to our cardiology friends and compared to our neurointerventional friends. They're much more on top of that, so they'll use the alternate inhibitors. Um, so Berlinta, FEN, or whatnot. Um, I think going forward, I, I thought about this, I have these arbitrary cutoffs. In 2021, I'm probably going to go with all Berlinta. Uh, and the reason is that way I don't have to bother testing anything. I do it for, make sure it's on board, either loaded or on board in their, brain, in, in their system. Uh, and then at least 30 days per procedurally when the stent kind of sits in there and gets endothelialized. And then afterwards, I don't mind keeping it on. Most patients don't mind it, but if there's a reason they need to stop, they certainly can stop. We, we, you're supposed to, if you're giving Plavix, you want to check, you know, uh, sensitivity and whatnot, but even that's sort of potentially difficult with interpretation and availability. We can't, so that's the thing I've thought about too. I can't make it standard of care because, you know, we may have it here, but if you go practice somewhere and they don't have it, so that's why I think going to Berlinta, I have no concerns about the bleeding. Um, it, it, it is not because it, there is a bloodless plane to get to, but there is no bleeding. So you really go through the muscle layer and that's it. There, you can do it kind of atraumatically. So that's kind of my little 2021 thing I'm probably going to do. You had a question in the back? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have an online question. Oh, um, hey, nice. That would be, uh, what about 
when will PRESS-2 come out? Uh, and what's your prediction on the results, particularly for the asymptomatic patients? Well, yeah, so uh, the, the question was Quest 2, what, what's, when's it going to come out? I, I don't know if anybody knows. Um, you know, I, I think not for a little while because they just literally, I don't know if it's been common knowledge, so hopefully it is, uh, but they're changing the protocol a little bit in terms of adding another arm or adding some component to it. So obviously that's going to be interesting. Uh, I think the, the results, wherever it's, it's hard to predict what the outcome is going to be. Uh, it's probably going to show that medical management is pretty dang impressive and good. Uh, it's not probably going to show this magical wonders of doing interventions on these asymptomatic patients. But my prediction is going to be uh, there will be a Crest 3 uh, because people are going to slice it up and debate it, and then we'll throw some more money at it, you know, uh, because I think it's a tough design, too, uh, because I think there are some inherent issues where people, you're asking people who normally treat with intervention, all of a sudden throwing them in a trial, and people have been selectively not putting people in the trials, which makes it hard to. So that's a very long-winded answer if I have no idea. <laughs> I'd just like to make a couple announcements if there's Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I put a couple links in the chat pod. The first two are for virtual exhibitors. Today we have Janssen Pharmaceutical and Pfizer. So for those of you that are online, uh, please take a look at that. Uh, we will also be sending out uh, evaluation for fall grand rounds 2020. I put a link in the chat pod as well, and we will be sending that out via email tomorrow. So, thank you for your time, Dr. Jim. That was excellent. Oh, thank you.